get ready for a deep dive into the world of nutrient density with one of the few people building a company in the space. Why did they choose to focus mainly on cows and grains? Hint, the climate impact there is just enormous. And shockingly, none of the retailers or food companies is measuring anything when it comes to quality. Everything is about quantity and availability. How do we turn around, objectively, one of the most complex systems ever, the food and agriculture system, from driven by chemicals to biology driven, focused on abundance as an outcome? The solution, according to our guest today, is radical transparency. Discover why he left a comfortable job at the Grantham Foundation, focusing on investing in neglected climate opportunities, mostly regeneration, and decided to co-found his own company. What are the connections between healthy farming practices, healthy soil, healthy produce, healthy gut and healthy people? Welcome to a special series where we go deep into the relationship between regenerative agriculture practices that build soil health and the nutritional quality of the food we end up eating. We unpack the current state of science, the role of investments, businesses, nonprofits, entrepreneurs and more. We're very happy with the support of the Grantham Foundation for the protection of the environment for this series. The Grantham Foundation is a private foundation with a mission to protect and conserve the natural environment. Find out more on granthamfoundation.org or in the links below. Welcome to another episode, today with the CEO and co-founder of Audacious, who are building a technology platform for differentiating food quality. Welcome, Eric. Thanks, Kim. It's so great to be back. Yeah, I was going to say, welcome back, Eric, actually. You've been <laughs> on the show a while ago um, when you were at Grantham, or the Grantham Foundation, uh, and you were focusing on neglected climate opportunities. And you identified one, I think a biggie, uh, or a very big one. And we've actually been making a whole series about that, a two series now on nutrient density and what it could mean for, for regenerative agriculture. Grantham have been supporting that. Um, and it's been uh, on my list, obviously, to check in with you what Audacious is, what Audacious is doing. There's not a lot. I mean, there's a bit on the website. There's nothing on LinkedIn. <laughs> so I'm, I'm very much looking forward to to unpack uh, your journey there or your the part of your journey we didn't cover last time because obviously, obviously that still has to happen. Uh, and why you went into, let's say, the deep end of the pool of this neglected opportunity, because that's definitely what you did. You went deep. So what happened since the last time we, we talked with uh, with Eric? Yeah. Uh, well, it's uh, it's just so great that all the work that you've been doing to really uh, bring these stories forward on uh, really connecting the dots between uh, our agriculture systems and the nutritional quality of the food that we're producing. Uh, and and I, I've really loved some of the, you know, the content that you've selected and the people that you selected. It's been it's been very educational for me. And that's why it's been exciting to, to be a part of this journey in a lot of ways. But um I think, you know, to take a step back, uh, my, my background is actually in forestry. Uh, so I really started uh, with the knowledge that I knew ecosystem services were going to be uh, play a vital role in global ecological restoration. Um, fundamentally, we depend on nature. And so a lot of my early career was spent around forests, uh, forest management and forest ecosystem services. Um, so uh, I worked uh, for an organization called Fona FIFO, the National Fund for Financing Forestry of Costa Rica. They really commercialized uh, what today we know as ecosystem services. Uh, they were experiencing rampant deforestation uh, in, the, in the 90s. And so they codified into law that we value and protect uh, the wealth that comes from our forest ecosystems. And um, that, was, that was foundational for me in my journey uh, from, from there, uh, I went into auditing, uh, funny enough. And so really understanding the pros and cons of certification, uh, when you send auditors out to forests and agriculture systems to say, are you doing this the best way possible, uh, within conformance of a standard? Uh, and that standard was the forest stewardship council. Uh, and so I got an early seat at the table for what became many standards and certifications which today many consumers know as labels. Um, and uh, then I went to go on and do my MBA and my Master of Forestry uh, and, and really wanted to kind of understand the trade-offs between 
managing for ecological outcomes and and traditional harvesting and 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 how to balance uh the duality of those systems um so everything i've done uh really has really had a climate angle and 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 forestry because it's so apparent is is quite obvious in terms of its impact um from from there i you know from grad school, I was really in, in exploring a number of different areas. I went into public markets for a stint. I was working for BlackRock on green bonds and, and, and climate education for portfolio managers. Uh, I worked for SJF Ventures, um, an OG in the impact space, and really began understanding what I would call the art uh, and science of impact measurement and management uh, and, and how we track and communicate outcomes. Uh, but foundationally, uh, and where where many uh, of your listeners know me from, is is from the Grantham Foundation, and so we have a long history a, in forestry, right? That that is, yeah, that's been a there very forever. long history. The family's been big investors in forestry, and 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 uh, the uh, the sons both work in forestry. It's it's yeah, uh, land management and the land ethos has been a part of that organization for a long time. Um, but over the course of time, they've moved from uh, in, in trying to stay true and catalytic, they have moved from being very forestry focused to more land focused to being more climate and technology focused. Um, and I was uh, a, a large part of that ride. And so for uh, I've been with the organization uh, over the past six years, uh, still very connected to the to the to the organization. Um, but yeah, you mentioned so neglected climate opportunities. Uh, NCO, as we refer to it, was a, a, a catalytic uh, investment portfolio for climate technology. So uh, I helped to build this vehicle and deploy it. Uh, it's now more than, I think, 60 portfolio companies, a few hundred million invested. Um, but the, the way we split it up was biology and abiotic solutions. And so I was really responsible for everything that was biological driven. So how do we activate all the potential biological solutions to climate change? Uh, and this was everything from oceans to forestry to agriculture. Uh, but fundamentally, biology really is about it's it, it's about uh, understanding how we use and interface with the land and the products and services that the land produces. Uh, and so this quickly, uh, from an interest standpoint, moved me from forestry to agriculture uh, because, you know, the land is the primary uh, agriculture is the primary interface that we have with the land. And if we can move the needle on agriculture, we can move the needle uh, on, on, on climate, so to speak. And do you remember when like the nutrient piece or even the word nutrient density like popped up because spending so much time in forestry, I don't think, I mean, quality, wood quality probably is a thing, uh, but nutrient density for sure not. Uh, like that's not a word you use regularly. Um, I, I'm imagining in, in the forestry space. So when do you remember when you, you stumbled upon this neglected opportunity? Yeah. Um, well, so in grad school, I, I very clearly remember a story from one of my professors, which is, um, two, uh, groups of foresters walk into a forest together, one American, one Japanese, and the American foresters walk in and they walk to the and they look up they look up at the canopy to to measure and understand the productivity and the japanese foresters the first thing that they did is they walk in and they look down and they look at the soils and they start probing and seeing what's going on uh in the soils and so um so much of forestry has to do with site prep site selection uh and preparing that ground for planting um and and so that the basis of productive forestry uh especially in, in uh, plantation based systems is is nutrient prep is is preparing that ground for productivity and so that's where i was really introduced to the concepts of, of nutrition uh and no it it is not you know in forestry just like in food we look at volume of output so we look at how much the system produces not the quality of that wood that's coming off the system. Uh, but we do know we can change and manipulate the genetics of those forests to get straighter wood or bigger wood or bigger trees. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, that, that idea is really just beginning to make itself uh, to agriculture, which we really hope to be a part of. Um, 
but you know the, the the core principle that I really took away from forestry is sustainability, right? So the FSC and the, the basis of forest management and sustainable forest management has to do with uh, productivity. So the forest has to produce more than we take from it, more than we harvest. This is foundational principle, and I and and I still think that the word sustainability applies just as much as regenerative because. You need to ensure that the principle, the the total abundance of wealth in the soil, is actually increasing beyond what you're taking from it. Um, and so let, let like, well, let's continue to use regenerative because I think it's it's you know it's it's a la mode. But um, what I'm really excited about is is the true potential of regenerative is positive mass balance agriculture, right? So positive what? Well. It's, it's the positive abundance of resources. In this case, resources are nutrients. The nutrients that we extract from our soils are the basis of our health and wealth and productivity as a society. Uh, so fundamentally, what we put into the land has to be less than we take from it. And the beauty of that is that it's possible because of biology. And we well, well, uh, there, I think we... I'm not going to say we lose people, but there's, there's a very strong <laughs> narrative in... I'm going to call them the techno optimist or the, um, let's say in, in, in other circles that that is not possible and we can only produce enough by a lot of inputs, non-biological mostly, but even, but like, um, to, to be able to harvest enough. And so we should, what we should focus on is uh, limiting the damage and limiting the damage control. That's what we should, instead of. And you're painting a very different picture in terms of abundance and a very different picture. As long as we harvest less than the system can produce, it actually can increase over time, which is a very optimistic view of, of the future and, and a very biology view of the future. What do you tell people when you're the, the, like, you've traveled a lot now, so you're in a flight somewhere or you're at the <laughs> dinner table or something and somebody's going to go, yeah, we just grow everything in a lab um, with some solar energy and just to limit the damage. And, and we, we, that's the only way to escape that um, uh, future where we have 10 and a half billion people and not enough, not enough calories, not enough food. Like what, what is your go-to answer there to, to um, not the, the armor or something that, that narrative, because it's a very strong one. Yes. Yeah. I, I mean, it's the foundational basis of the economic potential of regenerative, right? So it's like uh, inputs are less than outputs. Uh, and the evidence base that exists to show that this is possible uh, is still coming. But the evidence that I have seen uh, from from traveling and talking to, uh, to everyone is there are farmers uh, and ranchers that are succeeding on this basis uh throughout the agriculture system and they, they tend to be have been on the soil health journey for a long time uh but they are they are experiencing low to no input systems and they are seeing the abundance and diversity of nutrients within their soil is is uh beyond what they thought is possible and let's repeat it for the people in the back low or no input. <laughs> no it's because I'm, I'm realizing this is such a fundamental mindset shift actually we're recording a, a mindset shift series probably out uh, quite a few actually when when you you can listen to this or whenever you're listening to this long into the future but that's a fundamental mindset shift like you're we're looking for systems that are able to produce over time more over time while you're harvesting within the system within the limits within the boundaries a lot of very healthy and we get to the, the nutrient density what quality nutrients out of that system that sounds yeah. like magic, and but at the same time, that's how nature and biology works until we start messing with it. So there's there's a strong foundational basis for it, but it's it's also I want to emphasize how big of a mindset shift, how big of a narrative change that that is for most people. Not in our little bubble, we're all like, oh, oh, oh it's, it's it's perfect. Yeah. We all know, um, but just to to double click on that, and but you've seen it, you've told, you've seen the. It's still a very minority piece, uh, maybe. Partly because it does take such a long time on that soil health piece, which we're now speeding up and we're finding out. I mean, you've invested yeah. in many solutions there in a toolbox that can help. Um, but after you've been through that partly transition journey, things are starting to pick up quite quickly. And, and there is an abundance, which is fascinating to to think about or to even contemplate, because that's not what we've been taught the last 50 years, let's say, in school. Yes, yes. 
And, and I'll say that the, one of the best places I've seen it is is with nitrogen, right? So many farmers who have been on this journey for a long time are not adding any nitrogen to their soils. That is a big deal. That is climate. <laughs> nitrogen is something That's... like two to three percent of global greenhouse gas emissions. So when you have farmers that have proven that they have zero input nitrogen systems, and oh, further, the nitrogen that is in the soil is more bioavailable. Um, that, that, I mean, that's that's game changing. And so, you know, and nitrogen is one of the macronutrients that are available in the soil for plant health, in addition to potassium and phosphorus. But all the preponderance of micronutrients that are in the soil, they become bioavailable to the plant through nutrient cycling. And that nutrient cycling happens through an abundance and diversity of microorganisms that unlock that nutrition for the plant. Uh, and we're, we're seeing this time and time again. So the, the foundational principle on what on which we're operating is that uh, positive mass balance agriculture is possible. We're able to increase the abundance so that Ma we can mass sustain balance, withdrawals. Explain what, what do you mean by mass balance? Yeah. So uh, uh, think of this stock change, right? So at time zero, you have a uh, baseline measurement of the amount of nutrients that are available in that soil. You can then uh, do three things. You can send that soil off to a lab or stick a probe in it from my good friend, Chris Tolls over at Yardstick or use a biogeochemical model from my friends at Regrow. The, the, the most accurate is going to be sending that sample off to a lab and seeing what's actually in that soil. That's gonna give you, you know, your stock level. Regenerative practices over time through biology and through the, 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 the suite of practices will actually increase the nutrient availability, so increase the mass balance of nutrition that is actually available in that soil. And what that means is that nutrition becomes more available to those plants and those animals and then to us as humans. Um, and so, yeah, it's it's incredibly exciting. And I think this is part of the mind shifts, mindset shift that we all need to bring about uh, in thinking where the system can go. And, and then what led you to leave Grantham and for sure a comfortable job um, you could have put another <laughs> few hundred million to work probably in, in neglected, super exciting opportunities, uh, partly in nutrient density, but also in the nitrogen space. I mean, biology is a very, very wide space and you've made very, some super interesting investments. And But that doesn't mean you were done there in the sense there were many other investments to make. There were many other catalytic uh, places to go. And and somehow it was itching and, and you wanted to... First of all, become an entrepreneur uh, again, I think you have done before, or at least become an entrepreneur yeah. and go into a very unknown space of, okay, how do we, <laughs> how do we create radical transparency in the food chain, which is all known for not radical transparency around quality, yeah. which is even more like, what do we actually mean by that? Like what, what was the itch there? And what was the, the jump? Yeah. Yeah. Um, being an investor gives you an incredibly interesting seat at the table. It allows you to see, um, a whole range of ideas and solutions, um, but also fundamental principles of management and organization and growth. And, uh, you know, after five years, I just really felt like, okay, I've seen a lot. Uh, I've seen what's working and what doesn't work. And I was able to develop my own theses as to how things were going to play out, so to speak. Um, and my background in forestry and seeing uh, how ecosystem services had played out in that space made me really nervous about transposing a lot of that uh, that those tools and mechanisms into an agriculture based system, which is even more complicated than forestry. Right, <laughs> trees uh, are a lot easier to measure than than agriculture systems. Uh, what, what made you? And so, why were you so nervous, or what was the the, <laughs> the most nerve wracking piece on that? Ooh. Yeah, I mean, to get to the core of it, uh, I, I came of, of an age during the California cap and trade system and um, the, a lot many of the companies that were being regulated in that system were allowed to buy offsets uh, for something like 78 to 8% of their total portfolio of emissions that they had to uh, account for. Uh, and then I saw billions of dollars in, in forestry credits being transacted in California cap and trade. And, Having been in grad school in the time and, and and working with many organizations that were transacting those forest carbon credits, 
I I saw the true nature of those credits and 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 what they meant, and it was uh, not pretty. there was a lot of not 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 pretty. And so uh, the, what we're experiencing right now with Red and and South Pole and and many of those credit systems. I kind of saw that six years ago and I said, ooh, this is going to come to bite us in the butt. I think we need to try something else. And so we um, started looking like what what else could shift an yeah, agriculture and, and food it, system, which is way more complex, bigger, and, and, and it's easy to say, oh, we should just all pay a bit more. Um, but that's like, what else? Because people jump on the CO2 bandwagon or the carbon, the soil carbon credit ones, or now biodiversity and water. And like, so what, what led you then to the biggest lever or lever potentially quality like what was the the yeah okay so uh think of our uh, our mandate is to to get the producer the producer as the operator of the land to change the way that they practice and interact with that land if we want systemic climate impact we have to change their behavior uh and again this is like I'm not talking from a producer. I'm talking to them like I'm at the 30,000 foot view, looking down at a system and trying to understand how we move the needle in the system. So you have to influence behavior. Now, what are all the activities that actually influence that producer's decisions? So you have regulatory, you have financial, you have technological, you have social values, you have policy, and then you have the market. Right. So I had looked at all of those influences and all of them, uh, by and large, push themselves onto the producer. OK, so you, we tell you what rates we're going to give you and what you can borrow. We tell you how you can farm and what you can't farm with from a regulatory standpoint. Uh, we have ag tech pushing all these ideas onto these producers and say, please use this, please use this, please do this. But the fundamental root of a producer's decision is how do I make money? And, and there's two ways to think about making money in terms of profitability. You need to either sell more or you need to have less cost. And when you look at how their decisions are driven, they are reacting to the market. And yes, there's all kinds of behavioral economic theories that show that we're not totally rational human beings, but fundamentally, they look at price signals year to year, they look at crops that are available and they decide what to produce and what they can sell based on short-term, medium-term, and long-term relationships of what they believe they can produce. So when you think about the market and what it's asking for, it's asking for volume. That's how the, that's how the market's structured. So the three ways that we get paid based on food today are the quantity, how stable that supply is, and the quality. Now, the quality is this big fuzzy concept, and there's many different ways of thinking about quality. It's it's safety, it's provenance, it's traceability, it's, uh, it's, it's price, it's accessibility. Food quality means many things. If you ask someone, everyone's going to have a different answer every time. But the cohesive thing to that is taste, price, and how good it is. And, and it turns out that both of those things are really related with one another. So... The core theory of, of how we activate change is, is to get the producer to think differently about the quality of the food that they're producing so that they can get compensated in a different way outside of our commodity-based system. When you take them out of that commodity-based system, you can give them different incentives based on the quality of the food that they're producing. Now, the quality aspect that we have chosen to focus on is nutritional quality. Nutritional quality is the, and we can get into this whole definition on nutrient density and, and regen and how these two things are connected. But uh, the underlying thesis is that consumers are acting in their own self-interest. They care about what the food is doing to their health and wellness. And that is a priority over sustainability, largely. And so their purchasing decisions are largely to go towards, is this food better for me? If we can prove that this food is better for them, farmers are more likely to produce food that is better for them and thereby pull better soil health practices through the system and therefore linking our agriculture management system to human health uh, through, through, that, through that lens. Which assumes the big connection or the connection between practices and quality and, and flavor yes. and um, so what have you seen there or how do you start then when this, this, 
Um, let's say this theory of change, I think has been laid out before, um, and somehow we all get excited about it and then not too much happens. Like there's, there's this sort of wall that we're all hitting, um, yeah. with this and partly honestly, also with this series, like finding, um, the science piece is, I wouldn't say easy, but we have Fred Provenza, we have the Dave Montgomery and Bickley, of course, yep. like explaining science, but then who's going to build the companies around it and are going to deliver the quality piece is, is just tricky, tricky to find, tricky to, uh, to dive deeper into. And I think it feels we're very, very early. There's a lot of fundamental pieces that are, or were still missing. So where do you start when you come to that theory of change, um, conclusion and say, okay, we're going to build a company. First of all, you team yes. up with Jill Clapperton, who we had on the show. <laughs> um, but then, then where do you go then? Because it seems such a enormous wide potential. There are 10,000 routes to take. Like, how do you figure out how to build a company around that? Like what, what, what are your customers going to look like and who's going to pay for this? I mean, we know we, we all need it, but where do you start? Yeah. Well, uh, let's, uh, there, there's, there's a few components to this answer that I want to walk through, but, um, let's talk about the complexity of the system and why it's challenging to make uh, simplified extrapolations based on the system. And then let's talk about, you know, nutrient density and what that means. Um, and, and then I'll explain basically what Adacious is doing uh, to really solve these problems. So um, agriculture fundamentally is one of the most complex systems in which we work. You know, there's lots of complex systems, the human brain, uh, the power grid, the li living cells, um, but when you stack up is what is represented in agriculture, you end up with one of the com most complex systems possible, right? So, uh, it starts with seeds and, and all of the inputs that go into that, that soil, including fertilizers, uh, the genetics in that seed are acted upon by the sum total of attributes that exist in the environment in which the seed is working. Uh, this includes, you know, minerals, organic matter, water. Uh, everything outside the soil, temperature, humidity, precipitation, you know, weather conditions, et cetera. And then that environment is acted upon by us as humans through the totality of management practices that we apply to the soil. So uh, the way I explain to people is you could say that the environment is being epigenetically changed by us as humans, whereas the seed is being epigenetically changed by the environment, which it's growing. Right. So, uh, all of this results in two outcomes, uh, one which we measure constantly, which is volume and per unit of output, and the other that we measure rarely, which is the nutritional composition of that food, uh, because it is very difficult and expensive to measure. And I'll talk about why that is in a second. But fundamentally, uh, we have a very complex system with a whole range of permutations and potential outcomes. Uh, and so generalizations like regenerative agriculture equals nutrient density, I think, uh, can, can be destructive to the space in a lot of ways because it's simplifying the system in such a way that's just not possible. Um, there's a few folks out there that are really yelling this and I'd, I'd really urge a bit more caution because I think there's going to be a lot of disappointment. Uh, there are instances where this will be completely true and there are other instances where it won't. Um, so, uh, when it comes to, you know, does regen ag equal nutrient density? Uh, there's a lot of potential for the answer to be yes. And let's, let's first understand what, what that is, right? So regenerative ag has to equal a measurement. And we talked what that measurement is. It's the, the totality of, of, of nutrients and, 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 or, or I should say organic and non-organic matter within the soil. Now, when you have higher levels of, biology in the soil, you have better nutrient cycling capacity, which means things become more bioavailable. Uh, okay. So now what is nutrient density? Well, nutrient density has many definitions and people talk about it different ways, but FDA, uh, the food and drug administration of the, uh, the United States defines nutrient density as, uh, food, <laughs> whole foods, are nutrient dense, right? So according to our government, anything that is unprocessed is a nutrient dense food. And that is true. It is dense with nutrients. Uh, traditionally, scientists have defined it as the quantity of nutrients per unit of energy or per calorie. So watercress is more nutrient dense than a steak. Okay, well, that seems uh, counterintuitive, but yes, all right. Um, 
What we're doing uh, at Adacious is we're saying there needs to be a new way of thinking about nutrient density. We have to talk about apples to apples comparison, right? So it's it's really it's the abundance and richness of beneficial nutrients between foods of the same type. What I can say uh, definitively are two things. One, in in animal agriculture, you see more beneficial nutrient nutrition within that food when those animals are in their native ha habitat, right? When that animal is on grass, when it is in a woodland system for its life cycle, you end up with more, a better uh, diversity and abundance of beneficial nutrients. Compared to a closed and, system <laughs> fed with, yeah. And like, fun, yeah. like significantly more or a bit more or that that really depends but like is it like what's the different right yeah. so you're still getting the same if you compare two glasses of milk with one another they both have lots of nutrients in it but they're fundamentally different because of the composition of fatty acids the composition of amino acids the abundance of minerals the types of vitamins uh and and i you know to to generalize even more uh or to generalize less uh The fatty acid profiles are extremely important and very diverse based on the production system. Uh, I'll talk about aminos and protein in a second on the row crops, but the, it, it, they're just fundamentally different. The amino acid profiles look different as a result of different production systems. And we are seeing instances where there are greater abundance of vitamins and minerals within the food uh, due to certain management practices. Uh, and that's that is proving again and again true. If you take the same cow and you stick it in two different systems, right? Same genetics, and you feed that animal very differently, the milk looks very differently. That that seems intuitive, that is obvious. Now, when it comes to row crop agriculture, that is a much more complicated and complex system. You're dealing with lots of variables, lots of different inputs, and a greater diversity of potential outcomes as a result. What I can say is that with higher levels of organic matter, the better the ability to cycle nutrients, the better the ability for the to, for that nutrition to be available to the plant and the likelihood that that plant holds a greater abundance and diversity of nutrition within it. And we are seeing that in our lab, in testing, when from our some of our customers, when they have been on the regen journey for a long time, we are optimistically seeing, uh, especially when it comes to row crops, uh, specifically grains, we're seeing a greater abundance and diversity of nutrition within that food. And that's that's what the evidence says. Depending on the G, the genetics, the environment in which those genetics are placed, and the management practices that produce, that are acted on that environment, you are going to see a, a lot of variability in the nutritional outcomes of that food. And fundamentally for me, variability is good for our business. That's what we're trying to unlock. Uh, but I'm just urging a little bit more caution because you're going to end up with these, you know, organic producers who are finding that their their food has less nutrition in it, or you're going to end up with uh, people who are on the regen journey for a season or two, and they're like, well, why isn't my crop changing? Well, your crop isn't changing because you know those genetics have been optimized for chemical practices that are not have nothing to do with the system in which you're looking to deploy. So. Anyways, I just would. Uh, <laughs> and then are those the two yeah. main, you said uh, two things I can definitively say on the animal side and the crop side. Is there, what's the reasoning to, to pick, I wouldn't say animals first, but like animal agriculture uh, as one of the big ones? Is that because of customer interest? Is that because of, is it easier? Um, is it uh, also more controversial, like the role of animals in this space? Um, yeah. Can you then also do lab grown meat? Like, well, what's, why is the, the focus on animal protein um, <laughs> as, a, as a big one? I mean, we've seen that with yeah. the beef study of, of Bionutrient Food Association with Stefan van Fleet here. It's, uh, or here, like virtually here, of course, not here in the studio. <laughs> um, like it's, it's, it's a hot topic and a lot of people are shouting about it. A lot of people are, are very angry about it. Uh, what made you decide to focus uh, at least part partially on that? Yeah, uh, thank you for for asking this question. I mean, it, it's people they're like, Eric, you're so focused on climate. Like, what are you doing on this nutrition stuff? Like, why get away from it? And it's like, well, the crops that we're working on, if we can fix those crops, uh, you know, they're the biggest climate lever we have available to us. And that so that is 
uh, rumen-based animals, and that is uh, grains. So we are working on uh, basically cows and grains. Uh, it's like what we're interested in, in, in kind of impacting. So this, I mean, uh, what you're getting to is my ultimate gripe on where we're at with measuring the impact of the food system. So um, the, the, the climate space is operating on data that's uh, kind of uniquely extracted from a limited set of academic research that then is extrapolated to the whole food system. Are you talking so, about that famous thing that I see constantly on, what is it? One, my world in data, one world data, I don't remember. On, on LinkedIn, I think, and, and Instagram as well. Erof is going to be shouting out his laptop. Um, like the, the beef line and then everything else is better than that. Like that kind of simplistic... That simplistic mindset is the problem. Exactly. Uh, so uh, you basically what you have now is, is a bunch of scientists pointing finger at the whole ag system. And guess what? Everyone in the ag system is pissed off because they're making huge generalizations about a whole system. Um, so what we're trying to do is, is, is boil it down to productivity. What, what, what we're interested in is energy in and energy out. Uh, so the system has defaulted to greenhouse gas per unit of volume or per caloric output. And this is because we can measure it. CO2. And guess what? E, that's yeah. That, yeah. Yeah. So, well, <clears throat> fundamentally, we know this is flawed because not all calories are created equally. Uh, you know, this is the basis of our food system and commoditization is the root cause of all ecological destruction and human health impacts. So what we want to do is uh, move to what we believe the ultimate measure is greenhouse gas per unit of nutrition produced. It, this changes everything. It, it changes how we think about the productivity of the land uh, and what it can produce and, and how it can sustain both the land and us. So we have to stop comparing beef to soy we have to compare beef to beef. We have to compare soy to soy. Uh, and, and this is the evolution. It's, it's about, again, apples to apples because two, uh, you know, and I, and I think like just to take a dig at the plant-based movement, right? Uh, and, and I'm very pro plant-based movement. I think, I, you know, I have, I eat a lot of tofu. Like I love tofu. I love soy. I think it's an important part of my diet. Uh, but just because you have something in the shape of a burger, it doesn't make it functionally equivalent, right? Chemically produced GMO soy covered in pesticides is a different product from a grass-fed organic burger. And the substitute has to be a one-to-one -one exchange. And so these are two fundamentally different products when you, even when you have price parity. But when you have a truly grass-fed, regeneratively grazed burger, that also has a completely different greenhouse gas and nutritional composition from a burger that comes out of a feedlot and from an animal that spent most of its life in confinement. So yes, we have to do apples to apples. We also have to do apples to oranges. Uh, and we need to understand the greenhouse gas or the energy into the system required to extrapolate a unit of output. And for us, that unit of output is nutrition. And this, this really begins the uh, new systems thinking about like where we need to produce food, what types of nutrition we're actually delivering, uh, and, and begins to really connect the dots to the human side of the story uh, and, and bring about that radical transparency that you asked about. And, oh, there's so many rabbit holes. Um, <laughs> let's pick one, let's pick one. The customer side, let's start that. Like who do you, like so early in this journey as we're asking a lot of questions and you're asking a lot of questions that not many people have been asking or at least not enough people have been asking, especially in, in food and ag, like to switch a system, I don't know what lever level it is of Donella Meadows, I should know that, uh, of systems change, but it's pretty high up there. Like the goals of the systems change, like the goal going from yield to nutrition is is almost as high as you can get in systems change uh, to change the really the, the, the goals of the system. I think it's the, the second level, uh, almost the highest one. Who do you find then to work with? Like in terms of customers, because you cannot have this, like you need some kind of volume and size from within the current system to be able to run a company because otherwise you can't and it's just never going to get out of a, a tiny lab or even out of an apartment like how do you approach that of course you have the backing from grantham it opens some doors but at the same time at some point that's not enough like you need uh, customers like what are the type of customers if you can name them great if you can't also fine but who's working with you and who's interested in the stuff now even though it will disrupt them 
relatively fun, quite fundamentally. Yeah, yeah. Um, so let's I, let's let me take just one sidestep to explain what we do and 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 how we do it, and then how that's delivering that's value a good for point. our customers. Yeah. yeah. Um, so um, audacious. What we do is we we help our customers to measure, understand, report, and verify. Uh, the nutritional quality of the foods that they produce and consume. Um, so there's three problems that we're really trying to solve. Uh, the first is a data story. Uh, so we need to understand the variability of nutritional composition of foods um, better than anyone else. So uh, we're building one of the most comprehensive databases that understand the highs and lows of nutrients uh, that are within our within whole foods um, on a global basis. So that's part one. Part two is the measurement story, right? So uh, how do we drive down the cost of measurement to make measuring the nutritional composition of food more affordable and accessible? And um, this is, if you, it's, it's, it's funny because with Chris Tolls at Yardstick, um, we have a lot of parallels in our business, right? So you think about uh, lab-based testing, wet chemistry, you send a sample off to a lab, you wait for a result, and then you get information and you decide whether or not that information is helpful to you as a decision maker. So today on a piece of uh, a, a glass of milk or a piece of beef, if you send that off to a lab for analysis, it could, like, and you want it to go beyond the nutritional facts panel, so to speak, it would cost you 2,500 to 3,500 US dollars. Which is what every One farmer sample. daily does, of course. No. Oh <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then you get a whole range of information that you have no idea what it tells you and how to make sense of it and how to make decisions based off of it, right? So that's one, that's the measurement story. So we're focused on driving down the cost of measurement uh, and we use a combination of wet chemistry and spectroscopy and we own our own lab and our own instrumentation. Uh, but the third bucket is arguably the most challenging. It is the communication story. It's uh, how do we help people understand and differentiate the nutritional quality of the food that they are producing and consuming. So how do you take this complex set of nutrients and how do you distill it down to easy uh, visualizations and educational tools so that people say, oh, well, you know, this has more omega-3 uh, and this has more magnesium and wow, look at the vitamin B profiles in this food. Uh, well, that's really uh, easy for a core set of like people who are into the food and nutrition scene but making that accessible to my mom, not so easy, right? So the challenge is uh, communicating this information in a way that allows people to make actionable decisions, uh, be it in the grocery store or be it uh, in kind of B2B tools for trading on certain certain uh, uh, yeah quality attributes. So our customers right now are uh, within beef, uh, milk and grains. And we are helping them to understand the range of nutritional outcomes that are, they are seeing based on uh, their management practices. Uh, and it's been very easy for us to find, uh, I would call the, the people who are on the trending edge of regenerative and say, hey, let's, let's prove your food is different. And guess what? It is. And so it's very, uh, we, we have a range of customers where, where the evidence is clear. And now we're beginning to have conversations with that second set of customers. We're saying, we might don't know. Be, might be not that clear. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let's, Do you let's know? find let's out together. Yeah. And exactly. And I, I'll tell you, Kuhn, the, the most shocking thing about this journey so far is nobody does any testing. It's like nobody's sending food out for labs. Nobody is looking at it. It's uh, it's, it's, a, it's a bit mind blown. Yeah, yeah. Bingo. Yeah. Wow. Until there's, yeah. And it's really, uh, it's either lead, uh, or, or heavy metals or, you know, pesticides is really when, when thing, people start looking and then. What have you changed yeah, in your we, own diet since starting Audacious? Have yeah, you? And if so, what? <laughs> um, I, I actually, uh, during the pandemic went vegan, uh, for, for a few years to, to really just see what that did for me. And, uh, despite, uh, I mean, after an incredible, what I call vegan honeymoon and just like really just losing some weight and kind of thinning out, I was, uh, I just was starving, uh, all the time and I just couldn't get the abundance of nutrition that, that, that my body needed. And so 
now I, I really just, uh, I only eat food from, from, uh, animal. I only eat animal food from systems that I know where it's producing. I, most of my animal products come from a company called Walden local. Uh, Charlie's been on the show. Uh, and so I get that delivered to my door and that's, that's just, that's the only animal protein that I really consume. And, and apart from that, have you made any other, uh, shifts in your diet? Um, you know, I, to me, uh, it's it's all about diversity it, it really is uh eating the greatest uh range of foods possible because you're going to get a little bit of everything uh and and now i'm i'm personally really beginning to explore this question and and almost tracking everything i eat because if you look on uh if you look online and you say okay what's in this food i know that what they tell me is wrong and i know that what they tell me uh, is incomplete. So it's both wrong and there's not enough information. And then I'm comparing that to what are recommended daily allowances or daily values and trying to understand, okay, based on what the uh, FDA and the, new, and the National Health Institute say, I need to have in my body to optimize my health. Uh, am I actually hitting that? And what I'm realizing is all of the ways that they've come up with that daily value information are completely outdated, completely inadequate, and mostly based on um, what you would, uh, I forgot the technical term is, but like m the minimum amount needed to actually survive as a human yeah, being. Not to thrive. Nothing has to do with optimization. Yeah. And so I'm now beginning to go down this health journey and really understand um, because, you know, at the end of the day, the, Nutrients are the base input for all reactions in our body. It's it, nutrition is the sum total of uh, human physiology, right? So human physiology is based on the quality and quantity of nutrients that we put in. And we have such a low understanding uh, because of how we practice nutrition in today's world of what that actually means. Um, so, and, and this is equally as important. It, it's, it's not just what goes in but it's the quality of the system to which it is put in, right? And this is where we get into microbiome and the function of the microbiome. So you could put a bunch of really healthy nutrition in someone, but if their microbiome has been nuked by chemicals and pesticides and, and, and not functioning properly, that nutrition is not doing anything for that person. However, when you have that diversity and abundance of beneficial microorganisms that are present in either the soil or the gut, nutrition becomes more accessible for the host, right? Uh, and so I, I am constantly thinking about both these things, about the system in which we put that nutrition uh, and the nutrition itself. Um, and I've, yeah, I've been been making a lot of decisions uh, differently as a result. That gets us into the human health piece. Are you working on that side as well? or, or Because it almost feels like there are two sides of the same coin, of course, with the gut microbiome and the soil micro microbiome, but connecting it all the way through from soil to your gut and dust to your health seems a very long one, let's say. So what, what yes. are you, apart personally, obviously going down the health uh, journey, <laughs> um, are you working on that human, the human interface, like the human interaction, let's say, with, with the food piece? Yes, um, uh, we are, and I will explain how. Um, we, we are basically building knowledge tools that, that show you uh, the preponderance of evidence that exists that says a nutrient is beneficial or, or neutral or anti-beneficial, uh, an anti-quality nutrient. And so uh, our platform includes uh, the ability to learn about what those nutrients do for you as a human. And so it's more of an educational tool to say, okay, uh, this is magnesium. This is what magnesium does for your body. Um, and you're this is why more enough. magnesium, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> why you're likely not getting enough. Uh, and this is where you can get, this food has this much magnesium in it and, and where you can click, go to magnesium, see all the foods that have magnesium and then see, begin to see the variability of that magnesium within foods. So we're building, um, you know, it's, it's, it's coming down the pipe, but consumer facing tools to our platform that will help those producers, uh, communicate the nutritional quality of their foods to a diverse audience. And we're not just trying to say, and, and this brings to an important point uh, on, on the whole nutrient density side, right? 
Uh, we're taking a very objective view right now, right? We're not like trying to go out and carve a space and says, this is the audacious, audacious definition for nutrient density. We're trying to be supportive of the industry so that everyone can learn together objectively about what's the quality of nutrient that's, that's in their food. As soon as you move into this, like, uh, you know, this is better for you because of X, it, it becomes a little bit more subjective because of how we practice nutrition in today's world, which is there's, there's just two distinct paths, right? There's randomized controlled trials, which tend to be short term, very expensive, or there's epidemiology and epidemiology for all its flaws looks at lots of information and says, well, you know, based on this population eating these foods, it likely has this outcome. And I, I, uh, I have, you know, two nutritional biochemists and a nutritional bio uh, epidemiologist on my team. And we debate this stuff constantly about, is this the right way to educate someone and share whether or not these nutrients are good for them? And so our philosophy internally is to be very objective and be very truthful. Part of that radical transparency to help people understand the nutritional quality of the foods that they're consuming. Uh, and so we're, and, and we're trying to stay out of, you know, diet landia, uh, because it's just loaded with complexity and it's, it's the wrong framing for, for a lot of what we're doing. And, and when somebody throws like the board, you're like, why is this so fundamental? Um, isn't it just good enough if we stay off mostly, let's say ultra processed food and, and eat your veggies, preferably non sprayed and uh, because otherwise you don't have any gut microbiome left, but let's say most most get your veggies and um, and extremely diverse and low on sugar and salt, you, you'll be fine. Like what's for most people not hitting that anyway, like what what is adding a, a piece of, I mean, adding a piece of flavor is always good, but adding a piece of quality on top of that or underneath that and saying, actually, it really depends how your broccoli was grown, or it really depends this glass of milk, or it really depends um, uh, the fat piece. I mean, we've seen uh, the, the huge shift in fat research and, and like coming around that all fat is bad, etc. But like what what helps? Um, or does it just make it more complex adding this, this level of, um, of quality to it? Or is it fundamental because otherwise we advise people to eat more, a lot more kale and broccoli and actually some of that kale and broccoli could make them sicker, like Zach Bush found. Yeah. Or, like why, why go the extra mile for that if, if, if it's already difficult enough to get people to eat broccoli in the first place or diverse stuff? Oh God, you know, I love, I love this question and, um, let, let's come at it from a few different angles. Uh. The first is, you know, r remember how we started this conversation. My background's in climate. I'm, I'm, I see nutrient quality. We're not going to hit the climate, climate goals as a with, climate solution, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, okay, okay. Yeah. Uh, and so we're we're here for for ecological and environmental impact uh, as much as animal human protein impact. and grains, Bingo. large surfaces, yeah. huge emissions. However you measure it, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, the the first caveat that I'll say. Uh, I mean, I fundamentally agree. It's it's like the problem that most people have is not that their food isn't of a high enough quality. It's that they're not getting the right food to begin with. Right. So we have three problems when it comes to human health. It's culture, it's exercise, and it's the type of foods that we put in our body. Well, I'd say there's a fourth, right? Environmental toxicity as well. Uh, and uh, you'll notice that nutritional quality is not in any of those four things. Right. And so culture, we need to get back to surrounding our culture around food. We need to, um, uh, we need to exercise and be outside a lot more. Um, we need to get the right food in our systems and we need to remove toxicity from that system. Um, where I think the nutrient quality piece really comes into impacting human health is uh, two concepts. One, it's about um, the quality of calories that go into your system, right? So when you get more nutritious food, you eat less crap. Uh, and so that's, that's, they're proving this again and again, that when you satiate yourself on, on high quality plant based, you know, whole, whole foods, you are less interested in crap. And that is empty calories that come largely from processed foods based on, uh, fat, salt, sugar, and all the things that are detrimental to our body. Um, the the other side is that um it's 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 really about uh optimizing uh our human potential and it's about uh as <laughs> uh my friend dan kishish likes to say uh 
the vibrational uh, potential and the vibrational frequencies of our body. So when you have better nutrition, your body is be able, better able to resonate and, and better able to function uh, as a human. And, and I fundamentally believe that. And I know it from experimentation. And I know it from my family and friends. When they eat better, they're happier. And so uh, I think it is part of the story. And I think um, that we can do a much better job of showing that when, when we eat higher quality food, we have better health outcomes. And we're, we're, and I'll, let's go back to use this very specific example, right? So um, animal agriculture has shifted its fat profiles completely from very natural wild-based fat profiles to confined animal feeding fat profiles. What that means is we're changing the level of saturation within that fat from one that is uh, highly uh, poly and monounsaturated to uh, uh, just pure saturation. And this saturation is happening as a result of many of the omega-6 uh, fatty acids that come from grains. And those grains come in the form of corn and soy and, and, and things that are very good at storing long-term energy within the body. And so what we're doing is we're taking long-term dense energy, feeding those into those animals, ending up with completely saturated fat profiles, and then putting this, that fat into our own bodies. And that fat is causing inflammation. And that inflammation is slowing us all down. So um, there's more evidence, and Stefan is doing the, some of these human health trials as part of uh, the beef study and, and other research that he's doing to show that uh, the blood shows less inflammatory markers when you change the quality of the fat that, that you're consuming. So I think there are those lines that we can connect that show that higher nutritional quality has an immediate and direct human health outcomes. But I'm also not ignorant to the fact that like, if you just have a, a very low quality food diet of whole foods, you're going to be way better off than someone who doesn't have those, you know, those whole foods in their diet. And let's imagine you, you for a day you're you're in the Grantham seat again, and and you're looking at this space as an investor um, again. I mean, what like, compared to a few years ago, like what should I, I usually ask this question? Like, let's say we're in a theater where we have an audience. I mean, you know this question. We have an audience of, of people. We're doing this live, which would be amazing. It's going to happen at some point, people. <laughs> it, it will happen. But at the moment, we're doing this online. <laughs> but let's say there's this audience of investors. We're doing this in, in the city of London or on Wall Street um, or, uh, or or Beijing or Shanghai, like somewhere where there's the, the financial world. What, what you've seen now in the last couple of years, what does this mean for the investment world that is interested in food and ag, but also doesn't, hasn't gone down a rabbit hole completely yet to talk about omega-3 and omega-6 ratios, which everybody should, but still. Like, what does it mean for them? Is there one thing you would like them to, to remember? They, they walk out, they had a great evening, very inspiring, but also thought-provoking. But if we want them to remember one thing that they actually start doing with their professional life, with their financial hat, let's say the next day, what would that that one thought or that one action be? You, you know, it's funny. It's every, every time I, I listen to this podcast, I think I have a different answer. Um, and it's funny because now that you have me under the gun, I, I think uh, I think I'm going to choose a different one. Um, but the the core of my investment philosophy at Grantham was the the economics have to make sense, right? The underlying business has to have a fundamental value proposition that causes someone to do something differently. Uh, someone's problem is being solved. Something is getting paid for. We live in a capitalistic society. The mistake that I think a lot of people have made, especially in the impact world, is they become a, a, a values-driven investor. And that those values, um, and, and that, there's nothing wrong with that. I just think it's a different investment strategy with a very different return profile. So I, I think you have to decide if you're coming at this from a values perspective or if you're coming at this from a commercial perspective. Um, and they're not mutually exclusive, but they tend to be. Um, and <clears throat> what what I would recommend, uh, I'm not giving investment advice, uh, but is is to look at the underlying fundamentals of these businesses and what's driving them in, in how you allocate resources, uh, i.e. capital. And so if I took my, my impact and my climate lens off, 
I would make very different decisions than with it on. And the evolution of mechanisms that underlie pricing, i.e. environmental values or carbon or biodiversity or water, um, is not being transacted at a volume uh, and and quantum uh, enough to move the lever on systems change. And many of these things cannot function in the absence of policy. And, and that is one of the biggest pieces of advice I'd give is really to understand the Venn diagram between um, policy, regulatory, uh, social and environmental values, and then just core economics and, and, and business. And, and when you I think when you line those Venn diagrams up and you've, you're, you're going to find there's very few companies that exist in that sweet spot in the middle that are that are going to generate outsized returns, especially in the food and ag space. And that's really looking at, let's say, the current system. Let's say you're successful with Audacious and others as well, and the lever of quality and the, the, the quality piece becomes much more important in five, let alone 10 years. How do you sort of pre-shift already now as an investor? Like, how do you, let's say the oh, world yeah. of quality, like in the world of food and ag, quality is going to be a significant piece in five years and fundamental in 10. I, okay, start a journey maybe on as many farms as possible in terms of soil health. So you're ready for that. Like what, what would be a, a, a glass is like without giving investment advice, like you said, but what would be a, a framework or a narrative to look a framework to look at the world and say, okay, if I believe that that's going to happen and I don't know the exact date, I don't know exact technology, I don't know exact platform, yeah. but it will happen. What should I do now? Yeah. 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 Um, so <clears throat> Audacious is the internet, right? So the first innovation is web pages, right? So web pages are the ability to share information. So we're, we're, that's where we're starting today. We're trying to solve one specific problem, the ability to, you know, measure and report nutritional quality. So with that assumption that then everything changes, which I believe is the right assumption, uh, what do we do? So one, we look at the, the genetics and the research that's underlying our production systems, right? So we're gonna have to have more independence and research and understanding how different genetics act in different soil types and why. Um, That's gonna be an edge. And if, you know, it's incredible because I don't think a lot of the Syngentas and Monsantos of the world are actually thinking about this and I've spoken to them, Uh, but that's gonna change. So starting at the uh, beginning, per- like what's the app? I mean, the beginning is soil, but like what, what do you put in? Like that is optimized, as you said, for a chemical system. Until now, we switched to biology. Even most biology seeds are optimized for a chemical system. That's why we sometimes have the yield gaps. Like there's, so if we switch to a biology driven, non organic, I say biology driven system where quality is, is important, we need a completely new set of, uh, of seeds and seed companies and seed researchers and seed, 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 seed genetics, uh, uh, like yeah. that's not existing today at all. And that takes a year. So please go and Bingo. start now. Yeah. Yes. Start, start that process now and look at these outcomes. And that's, that's exactly the type of partnerships Audacious is ready to help unlock. Is like, if you're doing that genetic selection and doing that genetic experimentation, we're here to help you understand how those genetics express differently and what the range of nutritional outcomes that come with that are, right? Um, when you get to the producer side, right? So you, the producers, it's kind of obvious. It's, it, you're going to be marketing and communicating based on the quality of your food. It's going to change how you manage the land and it's going to change what the outcomes are and how you get paid at the end of the day. And so, you know, buy farmland <laughs> and starting investing in soil health, right? Um, part two, you know, or the third part is, is what I would call uh, the, the brokerage distribution trading, uh, the A, B, C, Ds of the world, right? So ADM, Bungie, Cargill, uh, Louis Dreyfus, Olam, uh, all of a sudden they're not transacting based on volume and quantity and calories. They're transacting based on nutritional quality. Uh, so they're transacting on the range of fatty acids. They're transacting based on the amino acid profiles. They're tra- transacting based on mineral composition. Um, and I think that's one that I'm really excited about. 
you know, uh, I've joked around with a few people that, you know, in, in 12 years, it'll be A, B, C, D, E, uh, for Audacious, because we will be the back end for a lot of that transaction. Which is radical because transparency and commoditization, not to pick on any of those, hasn't been like commoditization by definition means non-transparency because otherwise it's not yeah. a commodity and otherwise I cannot shop around uh, and, and get the lowest price point and quantity and availability, the highest availability possible. But quality hasn't been a core concept there uh, yep. for better. I mean, w because it wasn't and what that's going to be a fundamental disruption and some will take that very well and some others won't just like any yep. disruption we see, but how to get it from yeah the, the, the distribution with the widest range possible as a definition is how to get it from farm to plate, including processing and all of that processing another one probably that's a whole different podcast, but anyway, so, okay, that, that's a big piece as well, but, but yeah. it's, it's not right. So that's the next part of the value chain, which is processing and, and consumer packaged goods companies. What does right? it mean and when you process for quality? Hey, that's, that's just it. So we can use, you know, uh, well, let's use, um, Karen spring versus King Arthur flower, right? So these are two fundamentally different flower companies that take wheat, mill it and turn it into a flour product that becomes the basis for many processed foods. And the quality of that wheat is both affected by the uh, original product and both the processing process. So depending on how that, uh, that milling process happens, you end up with a completely different nutritional profile. So now we have, and we, we were, were experimenting with this in milk too, right? So milk is produced at one level, it's raw, and then it goes through various uh, transportation systems. It goes through um, a processing process, which involves in today in the U.S. ultra high temp, uh, which then just basically nukes the milk for any any biology that was present or left. Or there's uh, techniques like vat pasteurization, which have a much more softer impact on the milk. But that vat pasteurization means higher quality, but you can't ship it across the country and it's not going to be on a store shelf for, for eight to 12 weeks at a time. Uh, so it, it then, you know, beckons all these questions about regionality and, and the importance of eating nutrition closer to place. And we talk about the nutrition of place. The freshness. Um, I remember a story, was it Greg Schumacher on strawberries? They found massive differences on farm between organic yeah. and non-organic. And that difference had disappeared completely when they measured again on shelf and somewhere something happened was time was freshness <laughs> like they didn't really know but like something happened because that difference just disappeared and so there okay. is a thing for freshness yeah and and so we'll come to that and from the retail well so anyway so i think all the the all of the um, cpg companies are going to think about the nutritional quality of their portfo portfolios they're already beginning to do a lot of self audits uh the unilevers and the nestles of the world to really understand how shitty is our food and and what are we Nestle selling came out i think with that a big chunk of their portfolio was not couldn't be qualified as healthy that's their own research exactly. like, not, not ours yep. yeah yep yep um but then from there you have what i think are the biggest levers in the food system it's it's not consumers it's retailers and retailers have the biggest lever to pull on to ask for these products to hit their shelves or to ask that they start measuring this information in in in, in those ways and many of our customers are uh you know on the shelf of whole foods uh but we are uh you know and, and in conversations with that but so I, i'm pretty excited about the lever because it's funny retailers, retailers always say like yeah but it's the consumer that's asking for it well they first of all build the shelf and second of all guide us towards whatever they want us to buy like there's there's of course, exactly. we choose ourselves, but at the same time, it's a much more interactive relationship, I think is the, yep. the, the diplomatic way of saying. So they hold a, a, an important piece of this puzzle. Yep. Yep. Um, and none of and them so are measuring at the moment, I can imagine. Or none of them are measuring it. I mean, it, it, again, it goes all of the nutritional facts panel information, all of the regulatory structure really exists for processed foods. and. The FDA, the, uh, the Food and Drug Administration, does such little audit. I mean, practically zero auditing of any type of whole food that's coming through our system. So, no, you could you can get away with a lot of stuff and a lot of claims, um, but they're going to start paying attention to this stuff because you know they're looking at regen, they're looking at practice stuff, and they're saying, hey, you know, is this? Do we have to regulate this like organic uh, in in some type of way? Um, and then consumers, you know, I think I think what there is is just going to be more. Uh, cons retail consumer slash D to C consumers focus on nutrient quality and, and there's going to be direct channels to the consumers to access people who are 
interested in eating the most nutritious food at the end of the day. So, and do you yeah, see that interest? Like, systems. do you see that that pool? Because we started with the pool. Um, more, I mean, Ethan Solovev keeps saying Regen is hitting more nerve than than organic ever has. If you communicate it well on the soil health affair, does that? But like, is the consumer because we're all assuming that everybody in the it, that cares more about their own health and their family's health compared to environmental outcomes? Have we seen any experiments there? Have you seen any like consumer responding strongly to to this piece? Um, I don't think we have good A B testing that says. Uh, it, flower, and, flower, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. yeah, right. So uh, the example I always use, if I if I put two carrots in front of you, uh, irrespective of practice, and I say this, this carrot has eight times more nutrients in it. And again, depending on price, uh, which carrot are you likely to buy? You're likely to buy the, the carrot with eight times more nutrition in it because you would have to eat, eat eight of the other carrots to get the same level of nutrition that's in the one carrot. So whatever right? price, you'd be better. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's true. <laughs> so I, I mean, I am personally, and, and from an innovation standpoint, we are, I am beginning to explore these pricing dynamics. And I'll, and I'll use an example. Um, I buy uh, hemp seed, and I, and I love hemp seed, and I put it in my, uh, my oats in the morning, and I put it in my smoothies. Um, I've been buying these Manitoba, uh, I forget the name of the brand, but it's, I think it's, it's from Canada and, um, it's organic and they recently just came out with an ROC version, regenerative organic certified, uh, same product line, uh, different colors on the package, but I was in the store and holding these two things up to, to, to look at. And I flipped over look at the nutritional content, no difference reported in the nutritional content of the two foods, the price premium was 100 X, uh, 100%. Wow. So the ROC hemp seed was $20 per bag. And the, uh, the other hemp seed was $10 per, the just still the organic, organic. Was $10, yeah, yeah. but yeah. Talking still organic. Uh, okay. Wow. I'm not, I'm not paying 10 extra, you know, 10 extra dollars just because it's regeneratively grown. Uh, like, I'm sorry. And this is what we're seeing time and time again is, the consumers so you brought say it to the lab about- and put it. No, what did you do? <laughs> Come on. We, I mean, when we're a little bit bigger, I'll be able to to do fun stuff like that. But um, I, I, I just, I, I just know. Oh, so consumers, they all say they care about sustainability, and and when they do surveys, they really say this is important to me. But their mouth doesn't match their wallet. And they're not spending once you have those types of price premiums that are on the store shelf. This, and, and to them, it's the same product. So this gets back to our fundamental theory of change is if you can say definitively that this regenerative product has more nutrition in it and the price is close enough, I'm likely to choose the price, the regenerative one because I'm getting more nutrition uh, per, per, per dollar. Uh, and, that, and that's that's what we're trying to unlock. Oh, fascinating. I want to be conscious of time as well. And, and ask a few, I mean, we've asked a few of these already, uh, but now a few years in, let's say in the deep end of the pool of, of nutrient uh, quality and quality and flavor in general, what would you do with the magic wand? If you had to change, if you could change one thing overnight, what would you do? Yeah, I, I mean, I would introduce competition back into the food system, right? So that's the whole, our whole theory of change is decommoditization. I would remove subsidization from the food system in all shapes and forms. And that includes uh, energy subsidization, which is the basis of how our, our chemical system exists. I would remove, you know, a lot of the, uh, yeah, the, the nitrogen subsidies, the, uh, you, you name it, uh, crop insurance. Like if you wanna see innovation happen, if you wanna see what's really possible from a food and ag perspective, stop, stop propping up a bad system. So uh, yeah, remove the subsidies. Fair enough. and. When you go to, I mean, you've been to quite a few conferences over the last months. Um, when you go to, I don't know, a region food investment summit, when you go to the region ones, <laughs> let's say, where do you think different? Where are you contrarian? Um, apart from, let's be a bit more cautious what we claim on region and quality. I think that's a clear, a clear one. Um, but are there other pieces where you're clearly um, thinking differently compared to, to your peers? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I mean... I, regenerative is just a, is a buzzword. It's going to be here, you know, for the time being. Sustainability had a, a 10 year, 11 year run to it. 
I, I, I'd be surprised if it even lasts that long. Um, and, and it, and like I said earlier on the pod, it's like sustainability is the same thing as regenerative. If you are increasing the abundance, you, you are sustaining withdrawals over time. So it's the same thing as regenerative. It's replenishment. And, um, so I, I think there's just going to be another buzzword and another concept. The other, the other place that I am, uh, contrarian and, and again, I made a lot of investments based on ecosystem service and ecosystem credits. Uh, I, the, the asterisk I like to put on this is like in the absence of policy, these markets are never going to be as big or impactful as we need them to be for systems change. Uh, voluntary is great for transition finance, for like jumpstarting practices, for getting producers to think differently, to put a little extra dollars in their pocket. But we're never going to have systems change until uh, the regulators come in and say, um, hey, Cargill, hey, General Mills, hey, you know, food system people, we're going to regulate you for your scope three emissions. And you're going to have to account for them beginning to end and, and show that, that you're having measurable impact throughout your, your supply chain. And so because of the culture and the sensitivity around food, I really don't expect the regulators to take a stick based approach. And that's what we saw with, with climate smart commodities in the US. It's, it's very carrot based. It's very, we're going to sprinkle this money all over the food system and really see what happens and see if we get positive impact. But, uh, I'm not holding my breath that, uh, you know, Uncle Sam or the fe U.S. federal government is going to be regulating uh, greenhouse gases from the food system within the next 10 years. Yeah, nor I think the EU is moving, like deforestation. There are a number of, of but they also shut down very recently uh, a stricter, I'm going to call it strict, pesticide law after intense lobbying um, of the agrochemical industry. Um, so yeah, there's, there's just limited space in, in regulation. Um, and so let's, let's not hold your breath because that's not going to take 10 years. Uh, for a second, that's going to make you to, to get to 10 years. Um, I want to thank you so much for, for your time today, coming back on, on the podcast for listening, obviously, and for, uh, doing the work you're doing and coming here to share about such an important, such an early, but an exciting topic as well. So thank you so much for uh, being part of this series. And of course, for showing up here and sharing about the journey. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for having me. And thanks for all the great work you do in bringing this community together. I mean, I can't, I can tell you so many people who have come to me, who have heard myself or, or, or have learned from you over the years. And it's just like uh, such a cool thing. And so I'm wishing you many more episodes and, and continue uh, growth in your journey with this community. Thank you so much for listening all the way to the end. For the show notes and links we discussed in this episode, check out our website, investinginregenerativeagriculture.com forward slash posts. If you like this episode, why not share it with a friend or give us a rating on Apple Podcasts? That really helps. Thanks again and see you next time.